Hi, community. Um, I actually wanted to drop in for a moment and share a little bit with you about the evolution of my theology over the past few years towards uh, atheism. So I want to show you where I, where, I, where I started at and kind of quickly walk you through how I got here. And so um, because what I've realized um, is that my theology has been progressing towards this moment, possibly since the very beginning. Uh, there are even times now uh, that my wife and I will watch old preaching clips of myself. And it's just like, she'll point it out like, babe, that's, that's not regular church stuff right there. You're saying that's some of the stuff that you, you, you talk about now. Um, and I'm like, yeah, cause it, it was, you know, I was actually trying to, to get to truth. And then, um, and once I realized that my pursuit of truth was actually in conflict with my pursuit of God, that, that was kind of my final uh, line of delineation. But I want to walk you through this process, right? So uh, before we jump in, of course, don't forget to like the video, subscribe to the channel. Uh, please be sure to comment and engage because, as you know, I love reading your comments. I love engaging with you in there. We, we have some fun. Um, and yeah, we have some fun. I'll leave that there. Uh, and of course, consider joining our Patreon community or our YouTube membership community. We have, we have a lot more things rolling out and we are doing our best to stay on top of these things. Um, which is also why we're asking for help. If you want to volunteer and you actually want to be a part of building progressive community, this is your opportunity. What are you waiting for? All right. So I've done that. Let's kind of jump into this. Um, becoming, you know, if, if you've watched, if you've watched any of the, the interviews where I've kind of shared my story, the thing that that got me interested in Christianity after reading the Bible, because after reading the Bible, I was not interested in Christianity. The thing that got me interested in Christianity was attending a Pentecostal church um, because this church demonstrated a belief um, in an active presence of God, a God with active agency interacting with the world around us, um, with people as the conduit. And, and that, OK, maybe this kind of makes sense. Um, that that's not necessarily a foreign belief. And that belief may have been more natural to me because of my own African Africanity. Yeah, I'm, I'm going with it. I'm going with it. Um, and so that, you know, that that kind of spoke to me. If, if you spoke uh, for a living God with no activity of that God, you had already lost me. I was not interested. I wasn't I wasn't interested in believing God you know, believing in God as a kind of token of something to be mindful of um, without being able to interact with that God. So if if that would have been the story from the beginning, I would have not wanted any part of that, which is why I find apologetics absolutely hilarious, because the whole thing of apologetics is saying, yes, this God is not active. And let me tell you why he's not active, but let me tell you why you should do what he's doing, because the whole fact that you have to defend it says that it's not active. See, the only thing that needs other things to speak up for it are things that cannot speak up for themselves. All right. So, so because of that, my, my, my first little stepping stone of introducing, uh, of being introduced to the theological world was through Pentecostal theology. Um, I was going to a little church called Bible way church of our Lord, Jesus Christ. This was the church that I had gotten saved at. And it was super duper Pentecostal. I mean, every service was like five hours and there was a lot of yelling. Um, and, 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 but the people, they, they looked like they were really, really passionate about God. Now, one of the benefits of being involved in church without your parents actually being actively involved in church or being actively respected at that church is that people feel really comfortable showing you their true selves. And so it was ugly. I can say that much. But yeah, I, I, I did not enjoy that experience very much. But Pentecostal theology, and it was, it was at that time, it was just speaking in tongues and God can, you know, make you feel better. God can deliver you from demons. Um, God is stopping the devil on your behalf. And, and, and what I did realize, which this, this actually became a common theme, is that th these messages were, were always definitely targeted towards poor people and maybe targeted isn't the same isn't the isn't the best word because i'm i'm not suggesting that these pastors were, were were somehow not poor people themselves and that this is some great conspiracy um 
the more and more I engage with that Pentecostal theology of that particular church, it became clear. And, and I was a child at the time, mind you. And so I'm saying this from that child perspective. It became very clear that these people were not very bright in many cases and were not very intentional about their study and that the majority of their relationship with this this type of doctrine um, was a was a mixture of emotions, you know, what I felt at a certain time, and a mixture of appeal to authority. Well, the person who I who I feel this the most from, they say this, and so they're right. Um, around that time, I was definitely being introduced a little bit to TBN, so I remember Juanita Bynum and Bishop Jakes being two people that I was kind of looking into their books um, and, and, and watching them on, on television and, and actually going to the library to watch events that they were doing because there used to be a company way back when called Streaming Faith, long before YouTube and all this stuff existed, that was streaming church services. And I used to go to the library as a kid to watch church services. I know, I was weird. All right, so then I moved on from Pentecostal theology because it was just, it, it felt too limited. And, um, and I decided I didn't want to deal with um, denominations, for lack of a better word, anymore because the fact that, the fact in my mind back then, um, the fact that you were actively a part of a denomination, you know, means that you had kind of divided yourself against the rest of the body. And so non-denominationalism appealed to me. Uh, a lot more, even though they behaved and, and created the same type of faction. So in non-denominationalism, you do have word of faith. You do have word of truth. You do have um, a new apostolic reformation. There's so many branches. It's a branch that just keeps dividing and dividing and dividing. I mean, but even if you look at the Bible, that's that's the story of the Bible is that is that people just keep dividing against each other. It just keep dividing. And so that's because that's the story of your book. That's what you keep living out. You just divide against yourselves over and over and over again. Um, but so I was a part of uh, switched over to a more charismatic theology, which basically just meant open theology. God can do anything, you know, um, and it's, you know, they wouldn't say it this way, but I would. It's less reliance on scripture itself and more reliance on your revelation of scripture. That, that's really what the whole charismatic movement movement is about. If you can demonstrate that God showed you something about a scripture that no one else saw, you know, in all these, you know, 1500 years or so, um, then, then you got, you got a major movement, you know? And so that was, I was attending a church called Victory Christian Ministries International. Um, at that time, that was when I was living in Maryland. And when I uh, came back to Alabama and, and still, mind you, around this time, maybe I'm 15, 14, 15, um, joined a church called Acts Church Christian uh, Church, which uh, Victory was connected. Uh, they, they And that church is still still there. They're, they're under Creflo Dollar. Uh, he wasn't the pastor. He's the, the pastor's pastor type of thing. Um, um, and then Acts Church was a, a church in Dothan. And they're, they're still around barely. Um, but they they were under the Kenneth, they came from Kenneth e. Hagan, all right, Rama. He came, he was a Rama graduate and started a church. Um, and on television at that time, I was watching all things TVN, uh, especially Dominion camp meeting. I'd really gotten a rod parsley around this time. Yikes. I know, I know, but, um, but yeah, my, my theology at this time was definitely more charismatic and, and was more into the, this God of the gifts. Um, and, and that kind of matched with, with a, a worldview that I could accept at that time was again, that, that God is, is active through people, that we are the body and, uh, God has given us these gifts. And if we use these gifts, right, then the world works right. And so this is definitely, um, preparing me for a later kingdom theology, but, but at that moment, it was just, you know, everybody's an apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, or teacher. Everybody needs to be speaking in tongues. Some people has uh, the gift of knowledge. Some people have the gift of healing. Some people have the gift of word of knowledge. You know, some people have the gift of discerning spirits, but each one of us have a measure of faith, you know, that we can do these things. Which so I spent a lot of time in Romans 12 and Ephesians 5 and 
first Corinthians 12, you know, um, that, that, that's, that's where though, that's where the early part of that charismata was at. And then of course, um, as it evolved, I kind of evolved with it. Um, I kind of, I, I want to say I was ahead of my time, but it took me this long to become an atheist. So I, I don't think I can say that anymore. But um, but a word of faith theology is where, where, where that just kind of transitioned to, which a lot of those, a lot of that charismatic movement, that's what they were being um, kind of fed by at the time was was word of faith preachers that they didn't know were word of faith preachers. Just these word of faith preachers are being included um, at some of these charismatic events um, and then all of a sudden, charisma, uh, charis charisma and word of faith ended up merging. And, you know, the, the surprising offspring of that is evangelical. <laughs> and so, um, so yeah, so I moved definitely to more word of faith. Um, and, and that, and that it's, it's still building off of that, those same building blocks of that charismata and that, um, Pentecostal theology, of that God has given gifts, but by this time there there's it's more systematic. Um and so you you have people like Kenneth Hagen, Bill Heyman, um, I'm trying to remember Joel, John Osteen, Joel's dad. You have all these people that are writing uh, that are writing books that are system uh systematizing the 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 Christian church, particularly the Protestant church, which which didn't have a strong system. Um, at that time, at least any that kept it relevant to the communities around it. Um, and somehow that word of faith movement did that because a lot of the urban churches that we later got, they come off of the offspring of what the work that those word of faith churches did to almost change the imagery of church. So yes, while there were a lot of people who hated word of faith churches, because yeah, the prosperity movement comes out of that. Word of faith churches grew like no other churches. So the majority of those churches, when I shared with you earlier that only 2% of churches in the U.S. are mega churches, the majority of those churches are churches that are more associated with that um, word of faith type of theology. Um, and so at the time I was going to a, a fairly large church in, in Ozark, Alabama, out of all places, called Glory to Him. Um, I think I've shared stories about that church. Um, and by this time, as far as my, my, uh, outside influence, I'm anything, anything dealing with faith and anything dealing with supernatural. I remember this time I'm reading heavily, um, about the apostles of faith or the apostles of, of, of miracles at the time, people like John G. Lake, Smith Wigglesworth, Lester Sumrall, um, oh goodness, uh, Amy Simple McPherson, A.A. A. Allen, Jack Coe. Um, really getting into learning about those people and trying to mimic their, their, their spiritual lives so that I could be such a vessel and be able to lay hands on dead people or throw dead people against the body, uh, against the wall. And, and they start dancing that, that, that was one of Smith's or it could have been John G Lakes, but anyway, so yeah, so word of faith theology. And by this time I'm, I'm graduate around this time I'm graduating high school. I end up going to a church called Destiny Church, which was ooh, one of the worst periods of, of my life. And uh, but I'm grateful for it because I think that that definitely helped a lot of the theology not to take um, just seeing how criminally uh, negligent and deviant uh, some people could be while other people around just watched and and could not figure out if this was right or wrong which i'll be doing a video about some stuff on that later um after that i shifted to kingdom theology which and, and it's it's more it's, it's probably easier better to say transition because this was this was a the evolution makes sense when i look back on it moving from word of faith um theology to more kingdom the, the idea of the kingdom theology, and you'll see how this aligned with what I was trying to seek to understand from the very beginning, was that, again, that this God is not being active in the earth on its own agency, but that God needs people to be active in the earth. And this kingdom theology was ultimately this idea that it is not our goal uh, necessarily to get to heaven. That's not the goal. The goal is to bring heaven on earth and 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 at first it sounds kind of ridiculous but that actually is if you were to if you were to use mythical language to describe humanism that that's kind of the goal of humanism 
Um, which, which in, in, in the, one of the books that I'm working on, The Case for Religion, that's one of the things I seek to, uh, to, 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 to highlight is that in most religions, there is an obsession with creating a better world for humans. It's just that the people at the time who were doing this, you know, didn't really have a good idea what better was yet, you know, and it was for a lot of reasons. But this kingdom, kingdom theology, um, by this time, you know, I'm getting into pastoring myself. I actually pastored my very first church, which was, oh, my goodness, a horrible failure. And that was Greater Love Covenant Church. Uh, I don't think we ever got more than 20 members and we stole a building. I'll tell you that story later. But at this time outside, I was uh, connected to people like Bishop uh, Eddie L. Long. Uh, I was under his his ministry, which was I think was called the Father's House at that time. It was that father thing. Um, and then uh, I, on my later years, ended up uh, shifting to Apostle Ron Carpenter, who was in Greenville, South Carolina at the time. John Gray pastors that church now because Ron moved to um, California, which I actually will share some stories about uh, Ron and I because I have no bad memories. I have none whatsoever. I mean, uh, Ron seemed to be a true believer, one of the few. And and my, my, if my wife was sitting here with, with, with me, she'd be shaking her head because she knows um, how highly I talked about him, even while um, deconverting, you know. So, so yeah, very, very interesting thing. And, I, you know, other people may have other stories, but that's my story and I'm sticking to it. Um, and so, but I, I did shift from that kingdom theology, apostolic theology to still holding on to some of those ideas, but just realizing there, there's something a little more important. So then I got into what I call urban theology, uh, which, which, some of you would just recognize as seeker friendly. Um, and this, by this time, um, I'm, uh, pastoring my second church, which I was pastoring my second church under Bishop Long, Apostle Ron as well. Um, except for then it was kingdom and international worship center. Uh, by this time I had changed it to kingdom central. And, and for the first time as a black man, and this was very interesting for the first time as a black man, I started engaging my theology, um, as a black man, which I had not done before. Um, using my own Africanness and my Afrocentric lens on the text and exploring it from an Afrocentric or Pan-African worldview, um, which, oh my goodness, that accelerated some things for me. Getting, getting, getting in touch with black liberation theology was major for me. And so during this time uh, period, I had two mentors, uh, Pastor Mike McClure, often known as PMJ, and Dr. R.A. Vernon uh, out of Ohio. Um, and the Urban theology to me was all about church growth and excellence, you know, and excellence was ultimately defined as customer service. Do the members love coming here? You know what I'm saying? Um, but again, kind of uh, I do another video about inattention to results. Sometimes we measure that in really, really shallow ways. Uh, but that was definitely my focus at that moment. Is to um, is at this moment is to just be more relevant. I think that was the big word at the time to be more relevant. Be what people need. Uh, um, get more during this during, during this phase. My church did more community outreach than we ever did before. Um, I I became uh, highly involved in, in community affairs, not from a political level, but actually from a community level. When um, when someone got shot in the head, was not a member of my church. I was there at the hospital. I was there at all the family meetings um, because that's kind of what this urban theology was. And for the first time, I was a black pastor. P prior to that, I was just a pastor. I was just an apostle. I was just a prophet. But at this moment in my life, I became a black pastor, pastor very much attached to my community, uh, very much attached to what was going on there. And and for the first time, I had to familiarize myself with the art form of preaching, which, you know, coming through the lens that I came through, through word of faith, I never had to focus on the art form as much. I could just walk and talk, walk and talk. But um, when, when, when you do pass to some of my people, uh, sometimes they do want want a little bit of that art, um, which is all art at the end of the day. But they, they, they want something that's a little more culturally attainable, which is another thing that led to my deconstructing is realizing that that's absolutely fine. And it's absolutely fascinating. Um, an earlier part of my ministry, I wouldn't have been willing to do that. I would have kept, I would have felt like that was playing for God. But by this point, by playing with God. But by this point in my ministry, I, I realized that, no, this is, you know, my, my job as a minister is actually to the people, you know, um, 
and 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 if this is an art form that they love and, and what I'm looking at is that this is this is historically relevant, culturally, culturally relevant. So I'm thinking about it in those ways. And that helped me evolve to finally uh, but getting into more people centric theology, which is really where I, where I, where I, where I, where I, where I, where I exist now. That this that's how I became an atheist is I decided to just be people centric. That's how I became a humanist. And so my ideas are a lot more progressive. Um, I'm, you know, I don't, I don't believe in God. <laughs> so even when I use the term God, a lot of times I'm talking about social constructs that, that people created. And so, um, so now that's why I'm people centric theology. I'm all about the people, man, that that's, that's pretty much it. Even when I look at the Bible and we'll, as we're going through ex Bible study with an ex pastor, those are some of the things that I'm hitting. Um, we'll get into some of those things about showing you how this is incredibly obsessed with, with people. Um, and so now uh, my wife and I do have uh, two organizations that we, that we are working on, one called The Bridge and another called Bridge City. Um, and the whole idea of that organization is creating community uh, of, of non-belief, creating communities uh, for people to deconvert, deconstruct, for people to explore, for people to grow. And also as a way um, not to just create community among the people who are participating with the bridge. But, you know, my idea with the bridge is to actually create a place that bring brings everything together. Hence the bridge, um, an idea where all the non-believing groups can be promoted. All the non-believing groups can be resourced. Um, so that way people can actually find out about each other. You know, I don't I don't want to create something else that's just going to be another option. I want to create something else that is actually going to be plugged into everything else um, in an unbiased way, because we have a lot of great organizations out here that need our support. And so that's kind of my idea there. I want to create an organization that that helps in supporting those other organizations and while experience, experimenting with some things. And that's what Bridge City is for of experimenting with what actually creating community looks like uh, online and, and, uh, and offline. Um, but yeah, so so th that that's my journey. Um, I'm trying to get y'all some more shorter videos, I promise. But I just talk a lot. Um, I do want to say uh, I do have a, a, a new segment that I'm thinking about playing with, and I want to see what y'all think about it, right? Um, I'm thinking about doing a sermon review segment where I take perhaps – some sermon snippets from TikTok or Instagram that are really popular right now and just do an honest review of them in the same way I'm doing with Bible study with an ex pastor. You know, I won't be overly critical, but I'll share some things and not just to be roasting pastors. So, you know, I'm not going to do the Bishop Jake swallowed up. I'm not, I'm not, not necessarily going to do that. Uh, I'll be more so focused on what they're saying it and how it impacts what people think and how they make decisions in life. And whether or not this is a healthy, uh, mm, whether or not this is healthy or not, that's what we might call that. All right. But let me know in the comments how you feel about that. Also, let me know in the comments how you thought about what you thought about this video and my journey. Don't forget to like, subscribe, share, comment, engage and consider joining our Patreon YouTube membership community. We need help. So we're calling all volunteers. If that's something you have the bandwidth for, holla at your boy. And we do have merchandise if you have a budget for it. I love you all. Thank you so much for spending some time with me. Keep rising. Stay progressive. Stay beautiful.